So we're uh, closing in on finishing up this chapter. Need to talk about the compressibility factor. That's basically for real gases, which is uh, when you don't have an ideal gas, but it's close to being an ideal gas, we can use a compressibility factor. Uh, looks like I'm not going to really talk about software. I like to, but I'm just not going to have time. Students say, well, that's nice to talk about software, but is, is it going to be on the exam? No, it's not. Well, then don't talk about it, please. You know, just do things that are going to help me for the exam. So, but uh, there is software to help, as you might expect, evaluate thermodynamic properties a lot easier than going through the tables. But you have to do the tables. You have to master the tables. I think if you master the tables, the software is much easier to understand and avoid errors in. Because uh, somebody who doesn't really understand can get all discombobulated when they add the complexity of a computer algorithm. All right, so let's talk about real gases and a compressibility factor Z is introduced. Well, what is Z? Well, Z is like using a modified ideal gas equation. You could use it as PV is equal to ZRT or whatever other form you could use. PV bar is equal to Z. R bar T, that's the same Z, that's the same compressibility factor. So you'll see Z expressed as R, whoops, as PV divided by RT, or also PV bar divided by R bar T, either one. So if the gas is behaving as an ideal gas, what's the value of the compressibility factor? And sometimes it's around one, but not precisely one. We would say, ah, oh, it's close enough. Let's treat it as an ideal gas. But sometimes it deviates further away from one, and we shouldn't treat it as an ideal gas anymore. Actually, this is a good test. If Z is around one, then you justify using the ideal gas. And if it's not, then you say, it's not an ideal gas. I shouldn't treat it as an ideal gas. So often a student will ask, they'll say, how do you know that carbon dioxide at that pressure and that temperature can be treated as an ideal gas? You check the compressibility factor, see if it's close to one. All right. Here is a compressibility chart. Uh, what they've done here is on the x-axis. Can you see what they've plotted? reduced pressure. P sub R, the reduced pressure is the actual pressure of interest of the gas divided by the critical pressure of that gas. And they plotted a bunch of gases, methane, ethylene, ethane, propane, etc. There's quite a few gases plotted here. Now, before we jump into it, let's take a look at what's on the y-axis. What's on the y-axis? Z, what's the name of Z? Compressibility factor. Is Z dimensionless? Or does it have dimensions? It's dimensionless. It's dimensionless. All right? Yes, sir. Was P sub C the critical point? Yeah, for the, the critical point. That's right. And we'll show you where we get that critical pressure and critical temperature for each of these substances. And now, what they've done is they plotted a bunch of groups of, ter of, of data, and then they put a curve through it right here. Everywhere for that curve is an approximation going through that data for a T sub R equal to 2. And then this one's a T sub R equal to 1.5 and 1.3. Well, what is, what is T sub R? It's the reduced temperature, the actual temperature divided by the whoops, critical point temperature. So kind of if you think about looking at a diagram, you'll have a maybe, I don't know, a PV diagram, and you'll say, up in this region, it's a gas, it's a vapor in that, but it's close to the critical point, and actually that's probably the region it's behaving as a real gas, not an ideal gas. But you get away from, you get away from that critical point, either you get really high uh, temperatures or you just get low pressures, up in there, and it 
does behave as an ideal gas. Think of it either on a two-dimensional plot or a 3D plot. So it's gauging everything to how, where, how, where you are at in relation to the critical point. And a lot of different data, a lot of different gases collapse so you can have a generalized compressibility chart. Now, what you'd say is if it's anywhere around 1, then Z, oh, that behaves as an ideal gas. So maybe we cut and we say anywhere in here. A little above 1, a little below 1, it's behaving as an ideal gas. Well, we could see some trends. At very low reduced pressure, it behaves as an ideal gas, regardless of the temperature, because they're all converging up toward 1, aren't they? And then also, T sub R, if you have a high T sub R, so it's hot compared to the critical point, then it behaves as an ideal gas regardless of the pressure. So those are the two trends. It behaves as an ideal gas when P sub R is a lot less than 1, as well as T sub R greater than 1. Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, you can check it on the compressibility chart, but everything starts to get out of whack if you go to super, super high temperatures as well as super, super high pressures. But there's three charts that will answer that in the back of the appendix, and I'll point out the, where they're at. So, but, but what we have is a lot of gases over a modest range of pressures and temperatures compared to the critical point temperature and critical point pressure. It collapses to very uniform. There's some error around each of these curves. It's not like it's a very precise plot, but it gives you a general feeling of, oh, yes, I could justify ideal gas or not. And if I don't, and I still want to mo use a modified ideal gas equation with Z, this is the numeric value of Z I should use. So maybe with a, a reduced pressure of 3 and a uh, reduced temperature of 1.3, let's say that intersects right around here, I would read off and say, I'll use the uh, modified uh, ideal gas equation with a compressibility factor of around 0.65. This is one of those that you should have available to you during exams. Uh, it's in the back of the appendix. It's figure A1. You can see a couple figures. If you are not bought this pamphlet for the exam and you've chosen to print out the PDF version that you purchased, make sure to include those pages so you would skip the few pages that are for the English units, save some paper, but include the figures and charts part. Okay. So the first one is A1, figure A1, and then it has figure A2 and figure A3, but let's look at figure A1. It's only for a reduced pressure up to 1, so A2 and A3 go at higher reduced pressures. And you can see T sub R, the reduced temperature is 5, here's a 1.4, here's 1.1, etc. Same trend at low reduced pressures. It behaves as an ideal gas because it's close to 1. And at high reduced temperatures, it behaves as an ideal gas. Every now and then, you can get the Z greater than 1, but often it's less than 1. You can see that it's often less than 1. Let's solve a problem. Compute the mass of refrigerant 134A in a half a meter cube tank at a temperature of 80 degrees C and a pressure of 16 bar using the property tables for part A, assuming it behaves as an ideal gas, part B, and the compressibility chart, C. They will give you all three different answers. The most accurate will be the first because it's based on experimental observation tabulated and it's put into the tables. Well, why would you do the other two then if it's, you know A is more accurate as an exercise to see how accurate they are? Okay, so if I'm interested in computing the mass and I know the volume of the tank, what's the volume of the tank? 0.5 cubic meter. First clicker question. 
I know that I'm going to use the specific volume, but I can't remember if I either multiply by specific volume or divide by specific volume. I'm interested in getting the mass, all right? So do I use do I use the equation where it's the volume times the specific volume or the volume divided by the specific volume? If you think this is correct, answer A. If you think that's correct, answer B. Make sure and get an answer in. Well, to help answer this question, you might want to recall the SI units for mass. Kilogram, true or false? Yeah. SI units for volume, meter cubed. So I want to get the units to work, so it looks like I'm going to multiply by something that's kilograms per meter cubed. True? Then the meters cubed cancel and I get kilograms. So the units kind of guide me to the right form. So with that hint, uh, I'm not going to redo the clicker, but can you see which one's correct? Right? Because specific volume is meters cubed per kilogram. All right. All right, so we got that down. So we're going to use <coughs> this form. So what you do is you go to the table for part A, and you say, I need the refrigerant 134A, I need it at uh, 16 bar, and I need it at 80 degrees C. Can somebody find that for me, get my attention? Who, who wants to give it to me? Raise your hand. Okay, go ahead and give it to me. 5 meters cubed per kilogram at the units. So now, when you calculate the mass, you find that it's 34.8 kilograms. That's the answer for part A. Now, what about part B? I don't uh, uh, assume that the tables don't exist and treat it as an ideal gas. Well, I want to get V from an ideal gas equation. Would that be RT over P? R bar T divided by molar mass P? Is that how I would use the ideal gas equation to get the specific volume? Yes or no? Did I do that correctly or not? All right, so I know R bar, 8.314 kilopascal meter cubed per kilomole Kelvin. I know T, T is 80 degrees C, but I need to add 273 to that, so I have it 353 Kelvin. And then I look for the molar mass of the refrigerant 134A. Where am I going to find it? Where am I going to find it? Make sure we know where information is on the exam. So table A1, a line further down, refrigerant 134A. They give us the chemical formula. They give us the molar mass. And I'm going to need in a minute the critical temperature as well as that critical point pressure. All right? So those three pieces of information, two, the last two we're going to use for part C. But let's go back, use it 102.03 kilograms. So let's go ahead and put that in there. 102.03 kilograms per kilomole. And then the pressure is 16 bar, which is 1600 kilopascal. True or false? I think that's true. So kilopascals go, kilomoles go, Kelvin go and we're left with the correct units. So the specific volume, assuming ideal gas behavior, gives 0 0.0180 meters cubed per kilogram. It's not the same, is it? Compare those two values. It's off. And when we compute the mass, we compute it to be 27.8 kilogram for part B. 
which is a 20% difference. I'm sorry? <laughs> because refrigerant 134A at that temperature and pressure is not behaving as an ideal gas. It's behaving as a real gas. It's still a vapor, but it's not far enough away from the top of the dome, if you want to think of it that way. So the next part, use the compressibility chart. So let's say you didn't have the table. You have the compressibility chart, and you know the critical temperature and pressure of refrigerant. You can improve your estimate of how much mass is in there using the compressibility chart. So what we do is we say, well, uh, V will be Z RT divided by motor mass P. That's how we would use the compressibility factor. So I need the compressibility factor. Z is going to be a function of the reduced pressure which is the actual pressure of 16 bar divided by the critical point pressure of 40.7 bar. And it's going to be a function of TR, which is, let me kind of sp save space here. When I do that, I find that that reduced pressure is 0 0.393. All right, the next one is reduced temperature. Reduced temperature is 353 Kelvin divided by the critical point, 374 Kelvin, which comes in 0 0.943. So 0.393 for P sub R, 0.943 for T sub R. Let's go to the compressibility chart. So where is that reduced pressure? Right around here. True? And the reduced temperature, that's 0.943, so it's between 0.95 and 0.90. I just have to put a line in there that's okay, it's not 0.90 and it's not 0.95, it's around 0.94. It looks like it's going to intersect right there. And then I read off Z. Can you help me read off Z? What do you think? So Z, 0.82. Somebody else reads 0.81. Somebody else reads 0.83. They're all correct on an exam like this. Somebody reads off 0.95. You're wrong. <laughs> all right? So yeah, there's a lot of wiggle room because you're reading a chart. OK? Uh, somebody will always read off 0.826. I don't know how you do it. My eyes aren't that good. OK? But, but, but there you go. We're going to get 0.82. So once you get 0.82, you come up here and you have 0.82 times the same 0.0180 meters cubed per kilogram, which gives us a specific volume that's 0 0.0148 meters cubed per kilogram. True? Look at, hey, this is a lot better, isn't it? Isn't that a lot closer to the tabulated, which I would say the best number is? So the compressibility factor is going to improve our estimate of that mass. And then you calculate the mass using that updated specific volume. You get 33.8 kilograms for part C, which is around a 3% difference, which is, I, see, I hear a lot of good at mechanical engineers out there saying, yeah, that's pretty good. If you're a physicist, oh, no, I'm going to lose a lot of sleep tonight on that one. <laughs> okay? No, no, I'm just, it's close enough. Come on, right? <laughs> Let's move on. Now I want to talk about something really simple. It's kind of wrapping up and trying to put in perspective this class because we talked about material in different phases. What is one of our most uh, useful materials in power systems? Water. And what type of phase do we talk about? Vapor, liquid, solid. So let's do this. Let's start with water at always one bar. Never change the pressure. One bar. But let's start it at a really low temperature of negative 40 degrees C, and let's just start heating it. How would we do that experimentally? Well, you'd probably have a 
the traditional piston cylinder assembly, and you'd put your water right in there, H2O, and you'd start it off at whatever temperature you want to start out, negative 40, and then we're going to just start adding some heat. And we're not going to do it a lot, we're just going to add a little bit, so a little del Q. And maybe because we are going to consider one kilogram right here, the mass is one kilogram, you can always think about adding just a little heat per the one kilogram of mass. I'm not going to let the mass of the water change, true? So that's our thought experiment. Now, you help me a little bit. Describe the phase that it starts at. Okay, negative 40. If I pick it up, is it going to run between my fingers? No, it's solid. So it's going to be solid. Is it solid uh, close to being a saturated solid or a what I might call subcooled solid, which is kind of, you understand the term. It's going to be a really subcooled solid. All right, so it's solid at negative 40 degrees C. And could I get the enthalpy anywhere? Anywhere in this table, can you get me the enthalpy, which would be kilojoules per kilogram, the specific enthalpy of water at one bar and negative 40 degrees C? And when somebody has it, don't shout it out. Raise your hand. I'll call on you, okay? Hey, did I say bring the tables? Uh, you're not getting the most out of this lecture. 400. What table was it? A6. Table A6. Hunt in table A6. Now, I'm going to start this process. I start to heat it up. If I do the first law analysis for this little chunk of mass, what's happening? I'll have a little del Q, I'll have a minus del W is equal to DU, change in internal energy, true? We're doing constant pressure heating. It could expand a little bit. That W will switch over and combine with the DU to become a D. This term is going to come over here, and we're going to have del Q is equal to D H. Constant pressure heating. All right. And then what will happen is, is as you start to heat it up, you're increasing the enthalpy. Solid water, ice, all right, as you heat it up, okay? It essentially doesn't expand much as it melts or as it, it's before it melts, it's going to get up to the be saturated solid. It's not saturated. It's subcooled solid. It's, you're going to have to warm it up before it becomes, starts to melt, okay? So it's a really good approximation to have a constant specific heat times the temperature change. What you're going to see is I add a little heat, it goes to negative 38. I add a little more heat, it goes to negative 36. I add a little more heat, it goes up to negative 30. Add more heat, it goes to negative 20. Add more heat, goes to until what temperature do you think something magical will start happening where you add a little more heat and it's not all solid anymore? Zero degrees C. So basically, you're going to get it up to be a saturated solid at zero degrees C. Can you tell me anywhere in our textbook the value of the saturated solid zero degrees C? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this over so I can serve room a little bit. So this is our temperature column, and that's our enthalpy column, and all of them are going to have units of kilojoules per kilogram, and I'm repeating the de degree C, but that's okay. It's going to be what number? I'm going to truncate to four digits. Good. We got a confirmation. Anybody else? A couple of you. Excellent. Good, good, good. So now, what was happening during that, this, let's say, state one to state two, what was happening? You're just dumping heat in, and it's changing temperature. The world looks good. 
We owe a specific heat. You can go and get a specific heat. What is a specific heat would be? The specific heat would be the dH over dt. If you take a look at this, I got two values of H. I got two values of temperature. And I'll get a specific heat uh, about 2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. That would be the specific heat of solid as I'm heating it up. All right. Then what uh, happens as I continue to heat it up after it's saturated solid 0 degrees C? Does the temperature go up? I heat a little more. Does the temperature go up? I heat a little more. Does the temperature go up? Or does it go to become What temperature will that be, the saturated liquid? What's the enthalpy of saturated liquid at zero degrees C? You got it? Zero. I know it's, we don't have a data point. It's the, the temperature is 0 0.01 degrees C, rounded off to zero. And then the enthalpy is like 0 0.01 degree, or 0 0.01 kilojoule per kilo, rounded off to zero, right? That's what you were doing. He's a good engineer, right? I'm not trying to quibble about the fourth significant digit on some of this. Zero. You know where you got that out of the table? Which table? A2. Now, what happens? All that heat was added and it didn't change temperature. This blows students for a loop. They can't believe it. You're adding heat, professor, and the temperature's not changing? I'll repeat it to you on the exam, but I sure don't believe it. What's happening? Change of phase. It's going from solid to liquid. It's changing phase. It stays at one temperature. How much heat did you have to add? The H going from ice to liquid at zero degrees C is? It's right there before you. 333 kilojoules per kilogram. If I have one kilogram, that's about one liter water bottle. It was ice. I'm going to have to dump in 333 kilojoules. Now that it's saturated liquid, I continue to heat. Where am I going next? It's one pressure, one bar uh, pressure. The pressure is staying constant. Is it going to immediately start boiling? Nope. What temperature does it have to get to before the liquid wants to start boiling or changing phase, the vapor? 100 degrees C. It needs to get up to 100 degrees C. When it gets up to 100 degrees C, this will be a little tricky for you, but how would you describe it? It's saturated liquid. Hold it, Professor. You said it was saturated liquid down here at zero degrees C. I know, but that's the phase change from solid to liquid. Now we're going liquid to vapor. True? So what's the enthalpy of saturated liquid water? At 100 degrees C, or one bar pressure? 4, 1, 9, 4. What's happening here? Would I describe it by a specific heat? Could I describe it by a specific heat? Sure. The specific heat of liquid water. Would I use a similar equation? It's a change in the enthalpy or the change in the temperature. And the specific heat of liquid water would be, you can see the numbers right here, about 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. That's also confirmed in another table. Uh, table A, what is it? Um, where they have some solids, liquids, uh, uh, selected. A table A19 repeats that. You can also find this number in table A19. All right? 
Can you see that in Table A19? It's specifically liquid water, and it's confirmed with this enthalpy data. Now, I'm at saturated liquid. I add a little heat. I add a little heat. Is the temperature going to go up? You're so shy, you've been embarrassed so often. That's what students do. Man, no way am I answering any more questions. It just proved to the people around, and I shout out the answer how dumb I am, right? I got the wrong answer before. I'm tired of getting wrong answers. But don't, don't give up on me. Stay engaged. You add a little more heat, it's going to become saturated vapor. Will the temperature at 5 be the same as the temperature at 4? You betcha, 100 degrees C. Will the enthalpy at 5 be the same as the enthalpy at 4? No. Can you tell me the enthalpy at 5? Somebody get, raise their hand, and then I'll call them so they can read it off to me. Who's got the enthalpy at 5, other than a couple people up here in the front row that have been participating with me all day? Somebody new. Got it. All right. You're the man. Let's just leave it right there. 2676, right? You agree? Yeah, I think the one before that is the one before. All right, we got it, 419. Thank you very much. We're good, the three digits. Do we like uh, 2676? I need a couple more confirmations. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, now, somebody tell me uh, what is the... H, F, G. You can either take these two numbers and subtract them, or you can look at that column in between at one bar. What's H, F, G? One bar pressure, 100 degrees C. O, 2270. 2260 kilojoules per kilogram. 2260, anybody, you like it? I got a bunch of thumbs up, excellent. Now what happens if I continue to heat to state six, what's gonna happen? You're going out into the superheated vapor state. And so the temperature goes uh, uh, greater than 100 and it goes up, 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 and you're not going to get to another saturated state or anything, right? So, but when you heat it up, guess what? The specific heat of superheated vapor is around 2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin for steam, which is about the same as it was for the uh, ice. Just happens to be. But the specific heat when it was liquid is not the same. It's around a little more than double that, isn't it? It's around 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram. Well, I like to work through that process before I plot it. So this is how much heat you're adding. And you're thinking about starting the temperature at negative 40, that's close to negative 50. And then as I add a little heat, I get up to zero degrees C right and then as I continue to add heat I got to add around uh, 333 before I get to saturated liquid then I add heat and the liquids increasing temperature until I get saturated liquid but now it's ready to turn into vapor and as I add heat and this is true to scale Look how much heat you add to get it to boil. Remember that was our 2260 kilojoules per kilogram. So if I have one kilogram and I want to boil it, 2260 kilojoules of heat. Where if I wanted to melt it, only 333 kilojoules per kilogram. True? And then you can also do, okay, well, how much did I add the heat to get it up here? Well, you could see how much it is by that length of that line as well as to melt it. And then I just threw a point in and continued on. So the specific heats in those single phase regions, not changing pressure, approximately 2, 2 uh, 4.2 and 2 again for the vapor. 
And there's our heat submelting and heat of boiling or vaporization. Does this plot look good? I'll solve this problem, okay? Liquid water, and they tell us the mass of the liquid water is 1.5 kilogram, is initially at 20 degrees C. So the temperature initial is 20 degrees C, and it's to be heated to a final temperature of 90 degrees C in a pot equipped with a 1200 watt electric heating element. Let me kind of draw the pot up here. Here's our water and we're going to have a little heater element in it. And I'm going to try to the best of my ability to resketch this twice, you know, or resketch it. How do you like that? And there's the same heating element. All right. Now, you have 1200 watts of electric heating going on. Okay? So, they give us a specific heat of the water, 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. The heat loss from the water to the surroundings is negligible. Determine the time it takes to heat the water in seconds. How long do I have to turn that heater on before the temperature of the liquid water goes from 20 up to 90? Well, that's why I draw this twice, is because you could draw a control volume that includes the little heater element, or you could draw a control volume that excludes the little heater element, okay? Or a, a system is identified as including the heater element. What comes in across the boundary of this one, then, is some W dot electric, some electric power coming in to the system. But if you exclude the heater element, what comes off of the surface of the heater element that actually gets into the water is Q dot. Because that electric power has been replaced or turned into a rate of heat transfer into it. That makes sense? Now, if this one is 1200 watts of electric power coming to the element, what's Q dot getting into the water? 1200 watts. Uh, professor, nothing in the problem statement told me that. Well, you have to read the problem statement and then interpret that, okay? Right? I'm trying to make a little subtle point here. We could write a first law one way and it would be a W dot electric in. Or we could write the first law another way and it'd be a Q dot in. But they would be the same magnitude, 1200 watts. So for this system, let's pick this system right here. I want to write the first law for that equation. Is it for a process? for a rate or for an infinitesimally small process? It would be the rate equation. What is our first law? Nothing to do with chapter 3. Everything to do with chapter 2, right? Unfortunately, uh, this, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, thermo really builds on itself. It just really builds on itself. So it would be the Q dot in minus W dot out equal to the rate of change of internal energy with respect to time, neglecting changes kinetic and potential energy. Does that look okay? So if we say, hey, there's no workout, it's just electric resistive heating in. So I know that one. Hey, that's 1,200, isn't it? 1,200 watts then I'm able to think about calculating the time. So what do I want to do with this equation? Where did this equation come from? First law, conservation of energy. How am I going to then translate this into the time? You know me, make me happy. You just say separate, integrate. That's all. When you see a little du, dt or something like that. So you get du is equal to the integral, well, do the separation, then the integration. Okay? All right. So what a, what's special about this Q dot? Either the heater's on or the heater's not on. If it's on, it's a constant rate, so it comes outside. True? 
So it's Q dot times the time that you're running it. I can write it as delta T or I could write it as T final saying I'm starting at zero time, whatever you want to write it as, but that's our answer. We're looking for the answer to be delta T. All right. And now what about this integral du? Well, that's easy. That's just going to be U2 minus U1, the final internal energy minus the initial internal energy. And that's going to be the mass times the final specific minus the initial specific. Or if I want to, because what did they give me right here? Kind of if they give you the information in the problem statement and it fits, why not use it? So for water, we consider incompressible C T2 minus T1. Do you like that equation? Does it look good? Those steps to get there? Or did I lose you? So the answer, I'm going to kind of go back over here, delta T is equal to the mass, specific heat, the final temperature, initial temperature, divided by the rate at which it's coming in. Let's chase our units. One kilogram, no, 1.5 kilogram, isn't it? 1.5 kilogram. Specific heat, 4.2 kilojoules. I'm going to put the kilogram Kelvin down there. Okay, specific heat, they put it degree C. Does it matter if it's kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin or kilojoules per kilogram degree C? No, because it's a temperature change. And one degree Kelvin change is equal to one degree C change. Hey, I hope you take a class with me later on and, and, it, and you hear me have to repeat that again. You say, uh -huh, he said it early, early in Thermo 1. He said he'd have to repeat that again and again no matter how many classes he teaches. He teaches fluids, he's got to repeat it. Thermo 2, heat transfer, he's got to repeat it. Then you just sit back, yeah, all right. He had to repeat it, ha. <laughs> All right, now we're going to have a uh, temperature difference. This is uh, 90 minus 20 degrees C, true? And then what do we have for Q dot? We have 1200 watts, which is a joule per second. So I'm kind of speeding up the unit conversions there, true? And if I really want to speed up the unit conversions, 1.2 kilojoules per second. True or false? True. So you get good at it. Kilojoules go, kilojoules go, degree C goes, degree C goes, kilogram go, kilograms go, and we crunch and we find that the time needed is three, six, eight seconds which is good because they want it in seconds, but you could probably divide by 60 and find it's oh, 6.1 minutes, a little over six minutes. Okay. Did that make sense? Have a safe weekend, Monday, and then Wednesday exam.